As we begin to explore the unsolved, one should be prepared to swim through the realms of the criminal, the uncharted, and the paranormal. Cryptic disappearances and strange phenomena may find their solutions in the most unexpected ways. Number 10. The Spanish flu refers to a pandemic that plagued the earth from 1918 to 1920. It was found to be the worst pandemic in world history at the time. The virus had infected around 500 million people worldwide and had taken the lives of 50 million of them. 675,000 of those losses were reported in the United States alone. The disease was caused by a new strain of the influenza virus that had been spread by troops during the First World War. While this flu had spread throughout Europe during this time, news reports from Spain had not been subject to censorship and so the term Spanish flu became a common phrase. There had been no vaccines or treatments for this virus, which had caused social disruption throughout schools, churches, and businesses, which were forced to close. Individuals had to wear masks to protect them from this virus until it came to an end in March of 1920. Influenza refers to a virus that attacks the respiratory system. It's known to be highly contagious through the infected person sneezing, coughing, or droplets that travel through the air. Flu outbreaks are known to happen each year with varying levels of severity and on what type of virus is spreading. Flu viruses are known to rapidly mutate as well. The Spanish flu is characterized by chills, fever, and fatigue during the first wave of infections. But by the second wave, victims would develop more severe symptoms, which included their skin turning blue and their lungs filling with fluid. The mystery is, though, where did the Spanish flu come from? This question has confounded scientists for almost a century. But through a recent study in the PNAS, or Proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, a fresh answer was put forth to one of medical science's enduring mysteries. Researchers had been led by Michael Warraby, who was from the University of Arizona, where they would reconstruct the origins of the 1918 pandemic. They were able to conclude that the pathogen had come from an existing H1 flu virus, that had come from genetic material from the bird flu virus. This new H1N1 virus had the ability to evade immune systems, hence why it infected over a quarter of the United States citizens. But it had been those aged between 20 and 40 years old that perished during this time. Based on Warby's study, it suggested that the unusual mortality rate was because of prior immunity or lack thereof. Viruses constantly change and evolve, which is why there's no lifelong vaccine for it. Flu viruses are made from two parts, HA proteins and NA proteins. It's said that the HA protein drives our immune system's response. It was found in the team's research that the people who were born between 1880 and 1900 were the generation that had been hit the hardest by the Spanish flu. These individuals had also been exposed to H3N8 during their childhood when it circulated in 1889. They had not been exposed, however, to an H1 virus and therefore had no antibodies to fight off this new virus. Warby reconstructed the genetic origins of the Spanish flu and found that an H1N1 flu virus had been circulating a few years prior to the outbreak. Flu strikes commonly during childhood, which means that those who were born after 1900 would have had a previous exposure to an H1N1 flu virus, which additionally offered some protection against the mutated strain which was found to be a type of bird flu. Those who had been born prior to 1880 were exposed most likely to the H1N8 flu virus that had been circulating when they were young. In both the very young and old, having exposure to H1 viruses had given them some protection from the new strain, as compared to those who had never been infected by the H1 strain. This would explain the unusual mortality rate during the pandemic. Two avian flus, the H5N1 and the H7N9, have been periodically jumping the species barrier and have been infecting people. Many individuals had lost their lives during the 1918 pandemic, and at the time it was not widely understood. The mystery of what caused such an outbreak has confused scientists in the medical field. Thanks to the team of researchers, it was not long before the origins of the Spanish flu was discovered. 
Perhaps with further research, the medical field may be able to find a solution to such problems that may unfold in the future. Number 9. The Lost City of Ubar refers to a fabled story that appears in the Quran, as well as in A Thousand and One Arabian Nights. This city is celebrated as the center of the lucrative frankincense trade for 3,000 years prior to the birth of Christ. This fabled lost city has actually been discovered by a team of both amateur and professional archaeologists based in Los Angeles. With the use of high-tech satellite imagery and old-fashioned detective work, it was found that a fortress city was buried beneath shifting sands in an area known as Oman. This area is so barren that it's referred to as the Empty Quarter. Ubar had been built almost 5,000 years ago and was a processing and shipping center for frankincense. This is an aromatic resin that's said to be used in cremations and ceremonies. It can also be used as a medicine and perfume. During this time, frankincense was as valuable as gold. T.E. Lawrence, or Lawrence of Arabia, referred to the lost city as the Atlantis of the Sands. And just like the actual Atlantis, many people had doubted Ubar's existence. In a news conference that had taken place at the Huntington Library in San Marino, researchers announced that the site was due to be excavated over two months, which would reveal an unusual eight-sided building that was most likely as magnificent as the story portrayed. Additionally, the researchers were able to determine what caused the structure to fall and be devoured by the sand. It had been unknowingly built over a limestone cavern, and due to the weight of the city, it collapsed and fell into a large sinkhole, ultimately destroying most of the city and causing the remains to be left abandoned. The team had also found the remains of a Neolithic village, which is thought to date back to around 6000 BC. These discoveries are said to shed some light on the early history of the area that's been shrouded in mythological mystery. Los Angeles lawyer George Hedges, along with filmmaker Nicholas Clapp, had both led this expedition. During the time of Ubar, rainfall had been plentiful, and large water quantities did not only support the entire city, but also the camel caravans. The interest in this city had arisen when Clapp had first read about the city of Ubar in Arabia Felix, written by Bertram Thomas, who had spent years searching for the trade routes of Ubar. Lawrence had also planned an expedition in search of these routes, but unfortunately passed away before achieving his mission. Clapp, though, had some advantages, one of which was NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, which is most famous for its space imagery. He also had the gall to approach professional researchers with the idea of using the imaging capabilities to find the lost city. Clapp was able to convince two scientists, Charles Elachi and Ronald Blom, to scan the area with a shuttle radar system that had been flown on the last mission of Challenger. This radar was able to see past the sand and the soil, and could make out subsurface geological patterns. Using such imagery, the researchers were able to determine the trade routes of Ubar that had been packed into the hard surfaces by the passing of thousands of camels. Junctions where these routes would converge or branch appeared to be the locations for the city. Using this newfound information, the team enlisted an archaeologist from Southwest Missouri State University, as well as a British explorer who was part of the military. That December, the researchers would begin preliminary excavations of various sites. One of them was an oasis called Shizer. Thomas had stopped at this oasis during his search and made note of a fort there. Residents had told him that a sheik had built the fort 300 years prior. Thomas's studies had supported this information, and so he abandoned the site. Even though this site was a recent build, it was found by the team that the sheik had built the fort on the rubble of Ubar, and limestone blocks from the city had even been used in its construction. Thereafter, the researchers believed that they had discovered the mythological city of Ubar. It was located on a slight rise in the barren section known as the Empty Quarter. The structure is sometimes referred to as the Lost City of Arabia, or the Lost City of Era. What was thought to be the mysterious disappearance of a whole fabled city turned out to be an intriguing archaeological discovery that certainly changed the history books. The city of Ubar was not lost after all, but rather sunk into the sand as Atlantis sunk into the sea. Number 8. 
The infamous Watergate scandal refers to a series of interlocking political scandals that involved the United States President Richard Nixon's administration. It had included a break-in at the DNC, or Democratic National Committee headquarters, that's found within the Watergate complex in Washington, D.C. on the 17th of June, 1972. There had subsequently been a cover-up by the people who had worked for the White House at the time, as well as by Nixon himself. There were five burglars present in the ordeal, four of whom were CIA agents who were active against Fidel Castro. The fifth had been a security chief of the committee to re-elect the president. Also somewhat involved in the Watergate scandal was an anonymous tipster who was referred to as Deep Throat. This individual was responsible for providing Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein with some critical information regarding this scandal. The informant had worked as an anonymous government source who had assisted in taking down Nixon in the scandal. Eventually, in 2005, Deep Throat broke his 30-year silence and was revealed to be former FBI Deputy Director William Mark Felt. This individual revealed that he was the informant that was leaking information to the reporters. Throughout the 1972 election campaign, as well as the time beyond that, Deep Throat had fed the reporters a flow of information that would expose Nixon's knowledge of the Watergate scandal. It was discovered that the idea of breaking into the DNC office to tap the phones had been conceived by Gordon Liddy, part of the counsel for the committee for the re-election of the president. He had taken this idea to the White House counsel, John Dean, as well as the Attorney General, John Mitchell. They approved this idea, but on a smaller scale. During the break-in, the burglars went undetected, but on the 17th of June, they returned to the scene to fix some wires that they had installed. And this is when they were caught red-handed and subsequently arrested. After these arrests had been made, Liddy and his accomplices had begun to scramble in an attempt to destroy the evidence. They would deny the involvement of the president as well as anyone else in the White House, even though there had been a $25,000 check that was allotted for the Nixon campaign, which had ended up in the account of a real estate firm that had been owned by one of the burglars. During the time of this break-in, Deep Throat had been second in command at the FBI and had been the one in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. He and his staff began to interview various members of the CRP, but these interviews would also be attended by White House lawyers. Felt further believed that transcriptions of these interviews had been passed to the White House counsel, John Dean, by Patrick Gray, who was an acting FBI director. At this point, Felt had known of Nixon's involvement in the Watergate scandal, but after investigations had been derailed by the uncooperative White House, his connection would still remain a secret. Felt had known that there was a lot more to the story than believed, and had therefore taken it upon himself to release information to Woodward. Both the reporters would then ride this investigation out of the gate. According to the books that had been published, Woodward had spoken with Felt 17 times since June of 1972, until November of 1973. Sometimes these exchanges would happen by phone, but would also occur in person at a parking garage in Roslyn, Virginia. They would generally use clandestine tactics to prevent being discovered. The reporters were not allowed to directly quote Felt, and he would only confirm the existing leads, but as the investigation continued, he would start to offer some new information. In October of the following year, the scandal was linked to Nixon. This came after the FBI was able to determine that the operation had been set up of spying and sabotage that was done by the president's aides in order to support his re-election. Both Woodward and Bernstein would keep the pressure on while the White House had fought back. They would also claim that their ambitious reports had been nothing more than a witch hunt. Nixon was elected by a landslide, and it appeared that the tactics the campaign had used worked. But with Woodward, Bernstein, and Deep Throat at the helm of the investigation of the Watergate scandal, things would only escalate from there. After 30 years of an anonymous tipster, it was finally revealed who had dismantled the Watergate scandal from within. Number 7 Within the third zone, beyond the orbit of Neptune, one can find the Kuiper Belt. The New Horizons mission was to set out to this area and make a flyby past Arakoth, which the team had nicknamed Ultima Thule, one of the frigid bodies within the Kuiper Belt. The flyby of the object had occurred at 4 billion miles from Earth. These objects are said to be time capsules of sorts, 
having been in existence for around 4 billion years unchanged. It was initially believed that Ultima Thule was composed of two separate objects that were in close proximity, and had actually been two objects that were in direct contact with one another. A New Horizons team member named Mark Bui stated that data that had been collected from the object had given them hints as to how planets may have formed, as well as our cosmic origins. He further suggested that the object is made of two distinct lobes that had merged together as one. This may contribute to answering the questions as to the origins of Earth and the life that it possesses. The name Ultima Thule had been used by the Romans and Greeks when referring to a distant place that lurked far beyond the borders of the immediate world. It had been on New Year's Day in 2019 when NASA's New Horizon probe ventured out into the Kuiper Belt. This journey marked the most distant rock to ever be explored by humanity. While engineers began to celebrate once the probe had managed to perform its maneuvers past Ultima Thule, one mystery had remained unanswered for many hours. It was thought that the formation was a binary planet that was made by two bodies that were locked in orbit around one another, but the pictures that were snapped by the probe suggested otherwise. NASA had written that the object may have had a shape that's similar to that of a bowling pin that spins end over end. It's believed to be around 20 by 10 miles in size. It was also suggested that the object may still be two objects orbiting one another, but it appears that this isn't the case. Another mystery had been solved during this mission, involving Ultima Thule. NASA was able to answer the question as to why the brightness doesn't vary as the object rotates. It's believed that this is due to the spinning motion that it takes. It spins like a propeller as explained by NASA. Its axis had pointed toward New Horizons, giving the effect of an unvarying brightness. This would explain why images that were taken previously showed the exact mystery. That being said, the team of researchers still has not determined Ultima Thule's rotation period. It's thought that this object formed more than 4 billion years ago, during the beginning of the solar system. This object marks a relic of a bygone age which may help researchers and scientists unbox the mystery as to how all the planets had come to form. The New Horizons principal investigator, Alan Stern, had stated that the object was formed within the center of the Kuiper Belt where temperatures were found to be close to zero. Due to where it had been formed, as well as the fact that the object is not big enough to have a geologic engine such as Pluto or larger planets, it's expected that Ultima Thule is one of the most well-preserved hints of a planetary building block that's ever been explored. This object serves as a valuable window into the early stages of planetary formation and what the solar system may have looked like more than 4.5 billion years ago. It was on New Year's Day when the probe had reached the closest point of the flyby at 5.33 a.m. British time. It had passed by the object at over 3,000 miles an hour and came within 2,200 miles of the surface of this 19-mile wide formation. A NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine, had said the following, saying, quote, Today, New Horizons flew by the most distant object ever visited by a spacecraft and became the first to directly explore an object that holds remnants from the birth of our solar system. A composite of two images that were taken by New Horizons High Resolution Long Range Reconnaissance Imager, or LORI, provided the best indications of the object's size and shape thus far. Another image reveals an artist's impression of the appearance of Ultima Thule, based off of this initial image. The artist also shows the direction of the object's axis rotation with the use of arrows. A sequence of three images that was received on the 31st of December 2018 was taken by the lorry at 70 to 85 minutes apart. These images reveal the rotation of Ultima Thule. While not all the mysteries of this formation have been solved, some questions have been answered. Furthermore, it's been revealed that the objects are in contact with one another which may unlock the understanding of how our planet and solar system was formed all those years ago. Number 6 On the 10th of June in 1991, one of California's most notorious kidnappings had taken place. J.C. Lee Duggard was abducted while she was walking to the bus stop in South Lake Tahoe. She'd been kidnapped by a husband and wife, Philip and Nancy Garrido. 
She was only 11 years old when she was imprisoned in the home, where she would remain for the next 18 years of her life. JC had undergone some seriously horrific treatment during her captivity and had two daughters during this time. The girl was being kept in a ramshackle dungeon in the backyard of the Garrido home in Antioch, California. On the day that she had been kidnapped, JC was approached by a silver car, and shortly after, she was inside of it and heading to her prison house. At the time, her stepfather, Carl Proben, had been riding his bicycle close by. He had seen the kidnapping and tried his best to catch up to the vehicle that had lured the young girl in. This case would go on to haunt the family for the next 20 years. It was discovered that the man who had abducted JC was a convicted felon who'd already spent 11 years in prison. In 1988, he was released on parole. It was during this time in prison that Philip met his wife through a fellow inmate. After his release, the couple had moved to Antioch in Sacramento, where he would go on to build the backyard prison in which JC would be kept. It had only been three years since his release when he decided to kidnap the girl. She had been hidden from plain sight in the backyard, which was a labyrinth. It featured two sheds, two tents, an outhouse, and a shower. This compound had been concealed so well that during two separate police searches in 2006 and 2008, it had been left undiscovered. During JC's captivity, the couple had opened a printing business where one of their clients had been Shavon Molino. He had later stated that the family had been rather unusual. It had been on the 24th of August in 2009 when Philip and JC's two daughters would arrive on the campus of UC Berkeley. Here, the felon allegedly inquired about the holding events for a religious organization. He would be told to return the next day by one of the members of staff, Lisa Campbell. Lisa had requested that a background check be done on Philip, where it would be discovered that he was a registered felon. His parole officer was contacted shortly after, and it was found that during his time of parole, Philip had insisted that he had no children. After the officer was informed of the two children who were seen with the man, a parole meeting was ordered. Initially, he tried to maintain that the girls had been distant relatives, but had soon begun to crack under pressure. Both Philip and Nancy would be arrested and charged with 29 felonies, which included false imprisonment. During the investigation, the home had been raided and the silver car that was used in the abduction was found. JC, who was much older by this time, was reunited with her mother in 2009. Fred Collar of the El Dorado County Sheriff's Department had stated that the woman had been in good health, but that living the way she did in the backyard was bound to have taken a toll on her. Philip would go on to be sentenced to 431 years to life in prison in June of 2011, and Nancy was given a 36-year to life sentence. She'll be up for parole in 2034. This long nightmare that JC endured had concluded in August of 2009. She had later published a book in 2011 that was titled A Stolen Life, and in 2016, she would publish another that was titled Freedom, My Book of Firsts. She had featured in some television interviews where she speaks of the healing process that she had to go through. Number 5. In 1995, 14-year-old Tanya Catch had disappeared. It had been this year that she moved to McKeesport to live with her father and his fiance. At the new school that Tanya was set to attend was where she would endure bullying. Additionally, she would have to deal with a complex relationship that she had with her mother. The middle schooler would soon begin to feel isolated. A 38-year-old man named Thomas Hose, who was the school's security guard at Cornell Middle School, would turn out to be connected to the girl's disappearance. The events at this time would take a dark turn which would lead to Tanya's life being changed forever. She'd been lured to Hose's home in McKeesport, where she would be held captive for the next 10 years of her life. During these 10 years, Tanya would be locked in a bedroom, and if she resisted or attempted to flee, she would be harshly threatened. At the age of 24, Tanya had made her victorious escape in 2006. She'd been permitted to work a part-time job at a convenience store. Tanya expressed that reclaiming her identity had been rather difficult for her, but after a couple of years, she was able to settle down and find herself a better place. She furthermore wants others to know that there is hope after experiencing such severe trauma. The events that led up to Tanya being kidnapped started off with Ho's befriending her at the school. It was reported that he would take her out of class to talk with her, and on one occasion had caught her skipping class. 
Soon, he tried to convince her to run away or move in with him. Tanya had done this that February, and after four years, she was not permitted to leave the house. At the time, Hose had been living with his parents and his son, and managed to keep Tanya hidden from them during her years of captivity. She was confined in the house in the second-story room. In 2000, the security guard made a new identity for Tanya under the name of Nikki Allen and would introduce her to his parents as his girlfriend. Thereafter, she would be permitted to leave the house, granted that she stick to her very strict curfew. And six years after that, she managed to make her lucky escape. In later interviews, Tanya would recall that Hose wore a uniform and a badge and was supposed to be someone you could trust. She expressed that he'd even befriended her. During her time in captivity, she was only allowed to shower once a week in the cold cellar and even been forced to spend Christmas locked in a closet. After Hose had changed the girl's name, he would also force her to dye her hair. Later in life, she would release a book that speaks of her own ordeal that was titled Memoir of a Milk Carton Kid. She'd also expressed that she'd felt as though she'd been brainwashed and felt humiliated. She detailed that during this time, she would eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, bananas, and a can of Fago soda. Once she'd taken a part-time job, and after realizing that the relationship between her and Hose wasn't right, Tanya confided in a co-worker who would later call the police. Hose went on to spend 15 years in prison after he pleaded guilty to all charges. He was later released at the age of 65 and was registered with the Pennsylvania State Police under the state's Megan's Law. Number 4. For quite some time, a house in the pocket of Sunshine Coast had harbored the answer to a two-decade-long mystery. At the age of only 10 months old, Savannah Catherine Todd had been in the center of a custody battle when her mother had disappeared with her from the United States in 1994. Benjamin Harris Todd III, a South Carolina stockbroker, and Savannah's father never gave up hope in finding his daughter. It was in 2013 when a tip had come through, resulting in the Australian and U.S. police swooping into a Mountain Creek home on the border of Queensland's Sunshine Coast. Here, a woman was registered under the name of Alexandra Geldenheis. It was soon discovered that her daughter, Samantha, had been none other than the long-lost daughter, Savannah, who was now 20 years old and a nursing student. Alexandra's real name had been Dorothy Lee Barnett. She and Todd had married in 1991, but had split up right before Savannah was born. Todd's lawyer, Graham Sturgis, had stated that Barnett had struggled to remain in her seat during court sittings. Additionally, a guard had to stand behind her at all times during these proceedings. Todd was soon awarded custody of the young Savannah, and Barnett was permitted to visit her every second weekend. But unfortunately, Barnett refused to return her right after the first visit. Contempt of court proceedings followed, but the mother had been stripped of her rights to visit Savannah, and only weeks later, in April of 94, the two had disappeared, even though it had been a supervised visit. Todd's lawyer had accompanied him to the house in an effort to find the missing girl. Sturgis had stated that it had been the most terrifying part of the whole ordeal because he was uncertain as to what he may find there. He initially thought that she may have done something to the child or to herself. It was reported that when they arrived at the house, everything had been a mess. Food had been left on a map of Central America. Soon, Todd had become visible in the media and appeared on popular talk shows, which had included Montel Williams and Sally Jesse Raphael, who agreed to tell his story through articles in magazines and newspapers. A civil court case was also launched against Barnett, which would award Todd with $50 million for the suffering that he had endured. But it was not the money that Todd had his eye on. He and the lawyer were aiming for a subpoena and to take depositions from those they believed had knowledge as to Savannah's whereabouts or those they thought may have aided in Barnett's disappearance with their child. Barnett would go on to be accused of fleeing with the girl to Europe and marrying a man from South Africa. They would later move to New Zealand before ultimately settling in Australia in 2007. She was placed into Queensland custody before being indicted in the United States on parental kidnapping, as well as making false accusations in terms of passport applications. The states had planned to extradite Barnett and if she was convicted, she would face 20 years in prison. Savannah, who was 20 when she was found, was attending James Cook University and allegedly stands by her mother. She had insisted that she was not a victim and forgave her mother for the kidnapping, despite having spent her whole life on the run. 
Savannah had expressed that she always had a mother who protected and loved her. She also believed that Barnett had done what she had for a valid reason. When an investigation was carried out on the Isle of Palms South Carolina home, Investigators found crawl spaces in the closets as well as maps with cities and escape routes that had been highlighted. It was believed that Barnett had fled the states with the use of a fake passport and a secret organization known as the Children of the Underground. This organization is said to help women who are stuck in abusive relationships. Of course, this hadn't been the case with Todd and Barnett, and the kidnapping was based on the grounds that Barnett had not won custody. The mother had also claimed directly that Todd had been abusive, but after further research by doctors, no signs or evidence had pointed to any sort of abuse. Barnett was later sentenced to 21 months in prison and two years of supervised release. She'd been on supervised release up until 2017. In 2014, Savannah was reunited with some of her relatives, and in 2015, she was back with her father. Savannah hopes that she may maintain a relationship with both of her parents. Number 3. For ages, the question as to whether or not there's water on the moon had been wondered by many. In recent years, it seems that scientists have uncovered evidence of water ice on our moon's surface. The water ice is believed to be in the polar regions of the moon and is thought to be ancient, based on the proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Researchers from the University of Hawaii and Brown University, as well as Richard Elphick from NASA's Ames Research Center, made use of data collected from NASA's Moon Mineralogy Mapper instrument in order to make this mysterious discovery. This instrument had been on the first lunar probe of India that had been launched in 2008. It had been specifically designed to find signatures that prove the presence of water ice on the Moon's surface. Doing this would include gathering certain data that would not only detect the reflective properties of ice, but also the way in which the molecules absorb infrared light which is said to tell the difference between water and ice. There had been previous studies of the poles of the moon that had suggested there was a possibility of the presence of ice, but such signs could have been due to other phenomena. The water ice is found in the most cold and dark areas of the lunar poles. They can be found in craters where the sun may never reach due to the moon's tilt. Temperatures in these generally do not exceed negative 250 degrees Fahrenheit. At the southern lunar pole, Water ice may be found in these craters, and at the northern pole, the ice is more widely spread and sparse. This strange distribution hints at the idea that there may be a low water rate supply, or that the ice is rather ancient and has not accumulated much thereafter. A researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, Shui Li, had stated that they had discovered that the distribution of the ice is patchy, which is said to be different from other planets like Mercury or Ceres where the ice is pure and abundant. It was further stated that the spectral features of the ice may be suggestive that it was formed by slow condensation from vapor that was due to an impact or water migration from space. With some further observations and studies, more may be revealed about the evolution process of the moon. It's believed that the water ice may serve as a possible water source for future lunar exploration. It's also thought that this water ice may be easier to access than the potential water that may rest beneath the surface. Leah further explained that given that the moon is Earth's closest planetary neighbor, understanding how the water ice had ended up on the moon may also give us an insight as to the origins of the water on our planet and other planets throughout the solar system. A lunar mission that may come sometime in the future is necessary to examine the permanently shaded regions in order to map out the water ices and to further understand the processes that had led to it. It's research such as this that may pave the road for any future lunar expeditions, specifically that of the water ice being a potential water source. Future missions may already be planned out by the United States, China, and Russia. These places are said to have their eyes set on the south pole of the moon. They hope to research some of the most intriguing lunar mysteries there and perhaps make use of them. The Indian probe is responsible for this rise in interest in the moon, after its suitcase-sized rover had sent back some hints as to the environment they'd found themselves in. It had been when the rover found itself several meters away from the ship that it burrowed itself into the soil, only to find that there was a drop in temperature below. The surface area was found to be a temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 
but below that, the temperature dropped to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. There was additionally a presence of sulfur, magnesium, chromium, calcium, iron, aluminum, titanium, and oxygen within the moon's soil. It was also discovered that the moon's shallow axis of rotation, as compared to that of the Earth, meant that some of the craters present had not seen any daylight. Along with this, there had been the recorded drop in temperatures which is believed to have resulted in the abundance of ice, made mostly from water, which was either mixed into the soil or had been exposed on the moon's surface. The best evidence that researchers have of water on the moon had come from a NASA experiment from October of 2009, when a rocket had slammed into a crater that was situated in the southern pole region. The plume material had shown evidence of water, which makes up one of the most direct hints of water ice present on the moon. Number 2. In certain areas of the ocean, scuba divers have reported seeing some underwater crop circles. Symmetrical patterns carved into the sandy floor were a phenomenon that was first noted in Japan in 1995, close to the southern Amami Oshima Island, and no one was able to explain it. In recent years, though, it appears that this mystery has been solved, and the outcome was most unexpected. Recreational divers had observed the first intricate circle and called it a mystery circle. These supposed crop circles are not the works of underwater aliens, but rather an interesting creature, the pufferfish. As declared by a team of researchers, geometrical structures play a part in the pufferfish mating ritual. Based on observations, it was determined that the sea creature responsible was a small male pufferfish. It was reported that the male pufferfish will reconstruct these geometric circles on the seabed, which play a key role in the female mate choices. The fish will flap its fins laboriously along the floor of the ocean, which disrupts the sediment, resulting in an interesting creation. These fish measure only 12 centimeters in length, but are able to create formations up to 2 meters in diameter. It takes the puffer fish 7 to 9 days of tireless effort to complete their geometrical circle. While there are many fish species that have some interesting mating methods, the puffer fish has one of the more unique techniques. The constructs are made of radially aligned valleys and ridges outside of the nesting site. These ridges are then decorated using shells or fragments of them. We'll then gather up some finer sediment that will give the creation some color and distinction. The female pufferfish will then make her decision on a mate based on their construction skills. Researchers, however, are still uncertain as to what exactly the females are looking for in these constructs. If the female pufferfish is satisfied with the intricate design, she'll lay her eggs within its center, where the male can then fertilize them. It's theorized that the females may only be after the fine sand, and not these patterns and geometric designs. One researcher stated that it's possible that the valleys are being used to channel these fine particles into the center, and don't serve an aesthetic purpose. Strangely, these nests are never reused, and a new circle will always be constructed. This is believed to be because these valleys don't contain enough of the fine sediments for more reproductive cycles. At the time of the first discovery of these crop circles, there was uncertainty as to whether it had been a natural phenomenon or if it was the work of an organism. In 2011, it was observed for the first time that a small male pufferfish had created one of these geometric circles on the seabed. Some researchers have delved into the reasoning behind the constructions their functions, and why the patterns are not reused. Ten male pufferfish were observed in an area that was set up on the bottom of Sesui and Katesu. Only two males appeared in the observation area, and no other males entered it. The fish had been tagged at the time of the observation, but it's believed that S1, S3, and K1 and K3 had been the same individuals due to the lottery scars on their body. These four males had been present in both previous as well as new geometric circles. Researchers were able to capture the stages of the circles from early, middle, final, and spawning levels. It was found that the fish would make use of their pectoral fins and caudal fins while swimming in a line. They would also move in angles in a radial direction from the outer edges of the circle toward the inside. They would temporarily stop fin flapping when they neared the center. Through these intricate observations by dedicated researchers, it was found exactly what had caused these otherworldly geometric circles on the seabeds. It had simply been the works of a unique pufferfish in order to attract a mate. 
thus solving the underwater crop circle mystery. Number 1. In the most grasping of fantasy movies, fictional novels, and historical records, there's been a myth circulating for decades, the Kraken. For many years, sailors were terrified of the Kraken, a horrifying sea creature that had the capability of sinking full ships. There have been various tellings of such stories, and up until more recent years, we believed this creature to be a mere myth or legend that's been carried out through the tales of time. But in recent years, it was found that the mythological beast was no myth at all. These legends were actually based on a very real maritime animal, the giant squid. This creature was found to be the subject of various studies. Although the squid is incredibly large, it's strangely elusive and a lot of its biology is widely unknown. They are known to be one of the largest invertebrates and are considered among the largest animals on Earth. Males can reach a length of up to 13 meters, with females reaching around 10 meters. These giant squids were found to be longer than the Southern Ocean's colossal squids. Some unconfirmed sightings have claimed that these beasts can reach a length of 20 meters. They are believed to live an estimated 4 to 6 years. The immense size of these animals is part of a phenomenon called abyssal gigantism. Gigantism refers to the tendency where some deep-sea animals grow to be significantly larger than their shallow water counterparts. There are other examples of such creatures who are subject to gigantism, and these include the Japanese spider crab, big red jellyfish, as well as the oarfish. Initially, when one thinks of a giant squid, they would envision the ship capsizing kraken. Gigantism is a strange phenomenon that can be attributed to many myths and legends. This fantasy beast has actually become a part of South Africa's marine heritage. The excitement surrounding this creature rose when a carcass washed up on the west coast. These mysterious beings are so elusive that it wasn't until 2004 that one was photographed in its natural environment. Scientists are not quite in agreement as to how abyssal gigantism has come about, and since the deep sea is far too inaccessible, it leaves further research undoable. Another problem in studying animals with gigantism is that deep sea animals do not often survive being brought to the surface. These creatures that are grabbed by predators or snagged by trawlers end up being poor specimens for biologists. Even though these giant squids don't have swim bladders as fish do, they are still susceptible to injury when rapidly surfacing change in water temperature, or the change in water chemistry. This is likely why scuba divers have only come across giant squids that are deceased. Just because they are rarely seen alive does not mean that they don't thrive in the deeper areas of the ocean. Since there have been so many stories told of the Kraken, it is safe to assume that there had been prior knowledge of their existence. Aristotle of Greece had detailed truths as a large squid that was 5 L's in length. An L refers to the measurement of your elbow to the tip of your finger. Pliny the Elder had also described a squid that measured over 9 meters in length and weighed over 300 kilograms. The Nordic stories of the Kraken had also been clearly based on a giant squid. The stories of the large creatures reached European scholars, writers, and poets, and the legends have since persisted. Footage of these elusive gigantic creatures was captured for the first time by Eddie Witter and was set to make an appearance in a Discovery Channel documentary. Based on Bergman's rule, marine animals may grow larger in colder climates. This is supported by observations made in colder climates and the larger marine life that's found there, such as Greenland sharks and giant sea spiders. It's believed that low temperatures led to the cells of the animal growing larger. Colder climates also seem to slow the metabolic rate which ultimately leads to a longer lifespan. It so appeared that the mystery of the previously believed myth of the Kraken had been solved. The legendary giants were not a myth but rather a very real biological adaptation of deep sea animals. The legends that circulated most likely came from made up tellings when such creatures washed ashore and scared the residents nearby. From a Kraken to a Hydra, Sea Serpent or Leviathan to an act of abyssal gigantism played on a deep sea squid. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.